Okay, so we'll move on today to full thickness tears. And uh, we'll talk about uh, fluid locations that can help us here, retracted musculotendinous junction and scar in situ, muscle atrophy and rotator cuff arthropathy. Okay. Let's see, Taysen, where's Taysen? Should be first. I don't see, he's not here. Could somebody just text him and see? Yeah, I'm sure he might have forgotten. Okay, you're going to text him. So. All right, so we have a 45 year old with shoulder pain. Uh, looks like there's a tear of the supraspinatus, and then there's a huge uh, subacromial slash subdeltoid effusion with maybe some hemorrhage in there or synovitis. Okay, not a soft tissue in there. Okay. All right, so this was a big tear. So, what are you concerned about here? Um, so, this isn't the usual effusion we see, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's synovitis or maybe infection. Maybe. Yeah, I think that's right. So, it looks like synovitis acute and we usually don't see this kind of thickening, this kind of stranding within it, these areas of low signal, which might be acute hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly be concerned about whether this got infected. And we can see the, the supraspinatus full thickness tendon tear here. And, but see a lot of synovial thickening here, which could be reaction. And I don't, it doesn't look too bad in the actual glenohumeral joint space, so I would be certainly concerned about an infection, something like that. And I'll show you some of those later in the course where we have definitive proof that they were infectious. Mm -hmm. Okay? This looks like it's been there for, for quite a while. Uh, yeah, I, I can agree with you, John, though. If you have an acute Staph aureus infection, sometimes it can uh, look like that way pretty rapidly. Oh, yeah, but you have uh, muscle atrophy. The deltoid has got fat in it, so I, I imagine that that... Yeah, that's a good point, John. I, I don't remember that's what old, that... That's not recent. I, I agree with you. Good point. Well... Okay, so we have... An axial and a sagittal view. Well, this is a. These are both sagittal. Sagittal. Actually. Okay. So it looks like there's a focus of increased signal. Is that in the um, supraspinatus? Right there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right there. Okay. So it looks like there's a tear really of that anterior insertion of the supraspinatus and then, at a common location. And what do you see over here? And then on the other, there's a fluid collection. Um, bursal fluid collection uh, anterior the uh, subscap. And what's this? Um, it's at the if you were more if you were more superior, I think it would be the subscapularis recess, but that's the sub is that the subcoracoid? Right. Good. Subcoracoid fluid. And uh, so the mechanism here is that the joint fluid goes through the tear and the supraspinatus into the subacromial subdeltoid. The subacromial subdeltoid Hey, Tayson, uh, communicates with the subcoracoid, which is more dependent and in the upright position, the fluid will drain into the to the subcoracoid. So sometimes you won't see an effusion in the subacromial subdelta. It's we'll see post -op. It the subcoracoid. No, it's not post-op. And I'm not looking at the, the acromions, John. It looks like something's been done to it. Well, we're not really to the acromion here. Here's the where the CC ligament. This is here. This is we're not quite we're we're not quite including the distal clavicle here, and this oh, okay. is the scapula. We're not really including the acromion in this image. Where we're too medial. See, no, that's why I'm not a radiologist. <laughs> and then what you can see here, uh, here is fluid in the. Uh, and the joint space, and this part of the joint space is called the uh, 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 subscapularis bursa, which is really just a co component of the joint space. 
And here's fluid that's coming down from the subacromial subdeltoid bursa down into the subcoracoid bursa, which is anterior to the body of this subscapularis muscle. So, and then there's a the subcoracoid fluid. Tayson. All right, T1 and PD fat sat for wrong images of the right shoulder. Uh, I see the, uh, looks like there is a tear at the spinatus. Okay, so we see a lot of increased circumstances there. Here's the T2 sagittal. Okay, that doesn't, um, yeah, it looks like an anterior footprint. Uh, I agree. Yeah, we don't we don't really see fluid going through it here, so I'd be suspicious. But if you look down here, this is where the subcoracoid bursa is. Uh, that's a subcoracoid bursa. So then I'd be more suspicious, and then I'd look out a little bit farther uh, laterally, and here we can see that small okay, yeah. anterior, yeah. yeah, right there. So. Uh, and there, if you can see the actual fluid going through the tear into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and then it went down in inferiorly here, and you can follow it all the way down into the subcoracoid bursa. So, seeing the fluid in the subcoracoid bursa sometimes can reassure you that you're actually dealing with a tear, even if you don't see fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Okay. Okay, we've got some PD fat set images. The I'm seeing a lot of fluid in the subdeltoid uh, bursa, subcoracoid maybe also. Okay, I think we can see it looks like the patient's had surgery here. Mm -hmm. The fluid's going in fairly here. So uh, we don't not really have anything. This is in a this is actually a T1 fat sat image. Mm. And if you look here, there's a little bit of increased signal intensity here and the anterior uh, oh. and, uh, deltoid. Mm -hmm. uh, and the history here, and then here we can see fluid in the joint space. The history is this is an MR arthrogram of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So they, they injected in the, the bursal right. region rather than in so the joint? The bursal injection rather than the joint mm -hmm. injection. Okay. Uh, and there's a patient after surgery, and we can see some fluid in the subcoracoid bursa down here near the surgery. All right, so we got a coronal here. It looks like there's a tear. It looks almost full thickness of the supraspinatus there at the foot plate. Okay. Here are the sagittals. On the left image, it still looks like a full thickness tear there. Okay. And here, fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid, some fluid coming down here. And yeah. So just showing fluid through a full thickness tear. Okay. And then here we can see a full thickness tear. And here we have proximal, a little bit of proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction. Here we can see a very degenerated tear with severe degenerative disease of the residual supraspinatus tendon. Sagittal images, we can see a very large tear here. This is pretty much the entire foot plate of the supraspinatus. Uh, this is probably the overlap area. There's probably a little bit of tearing of the anterior fibers of the infraspinatus, and this would be infraspinatus and teres minor down here. Okay. Is this the same patient? I don't, don't know. I think this... Wow. Okay, uh, Greg, John, did you have a question? Uh, uh, no, I, I lost your sound for a while. Um, the, the question I have on this case that you just showed, I, I didn't hear anything but what you said, but uh, is, it, is it possible that the infraspinatus uh, has another lesion going um, in an L-shape? 
in other okay. words, tra uh, transfers. I think this is just... And then, <laughs> and then the tear going... Uh, the, uh, yeah. With the fibers? Uh, I think this is just... A long a, extension? I think there's a full thickness, full width tear of the supraspinatus tendon with a lot of scarring here that's limiting retraction. And then if we go to the sagittals, oops. If we go to the sagittals, this is really pretty much the entire supraspinatus foot plate, probably the crossover areas of some supraspinatus and infraspinatus here. So I think this tear goes into a little bit of the anterior fibers of the infraspinatus, but the bulk of the infraspinatus fibers are intact. Yeah, but uh, you can have it that uh, uh, going medially in, in, in that area. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's an L-shaped tear. No, 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 that's what I wanted to yeah. hear from you. That's obviously a repairable lesion. Well, I would, I would operate on that. So we have a coronal T2, I think. Um, it looks like there's a an ovoid high point tense. High, yeah, the high point intensity there. Um, is that in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa? I'm not. Like, so what could be low and signal like that inside the bursa? Could it be could it be part of the tendon. Okay, so let me show you some other images. Here's the axial image. So the axial image um, looks like there is something with low signal intensity. Yeah, right there, kind of in the bursa, some bursal fluid. What is this? Um, is that the, is that, it's like a tendon that's torn. What tendon? Is that the supraspinatus? Yeah, it's the anterior supraspinatus. And, uh, yeah, this coronal image is, it cuts right through here. So it looks like you have a low signal mass within the supraspinatus tendon, maybe a focal hematoma, except hemat clots aren't supposed to happen where you have fluid to dilute the clotting agents. And this was just a tear of the anterior supraspinatus tendons, which retracted back a little bit. The posterior fibers stayed intact. And we're just seeing the tendon extending uh, anteriorly. And that's the tear site. So that was just a supraspinatus tendon tear. Taysen. When, when you look for that uh, uh, injury uh, arthroscopically, that becomes a, you, you got to really tell an orthopedic surgeon what, what you're seeing there. Thanks. That's a danger. That can be a dangerous area to fool around in. Okay. okay. Thank you. Tayson. All right. So it looks like we are looking at coronal images of the shoulder at the level of the supraspinatus tendon. It looks like there's a full thickness tear at the foot plate. Okay. So this is a full thickness. This is a full width tear again of the supraspinatus. We can see there's retraction of the musculotendinous junction, full thickness tear, and then here we can see some tendinosis in the infraspinatus tendon. Yeah. Good. Uh, if you look at the muscle, though, that's very interesting. It, it, it's either from bulking up because of the tear or, or he's a very muscular person. Yeah, this was an athlete, so he was a big weightlifter. Interesting yeah. that you don't see free flow of fluid into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And when this these occur due to chronic disease, you can have a lot of scarring there, which actually limits free communication of fluid. So just remember that can happen in the more chronic type tears. That's probably an acute uh, situation, don't you think? Uh, no, I think if it were acute, we'd see a lot more free flow of contrast here. I think this is a little bit more of a chronic situation, John. You're saying it created like a like a pseudo capsule on top? To yes. Right. Yeah. Because it, it it makes a difference on that on a treatment. 
Okay. If it's chronic, you, 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 you use uh, um, exercise uh, to, to try to get rid of the symptoms if, uh, if possible. And then if you don't get rid of the symptoms, you operate. Uh, if it's an acute, you want to do that right, right away or at least before three months go by. Once three months go by, then you're treating it like a chronic, okay. uh, which, which makes it an entirely different situation. Thank you. Mm, okay. Looking at the supraspinatus tendon, we have a T1 on the left. We see some maybe thickening of the tendon fibers there. The T2 in the middle, those look intact, but I see retraction of the myotendinous junction. And it's way over here. Yeah. You see, well, it looks like some end of tendons there. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? It looks like there was a full thickness tear. This could be scar in situ, yeah. So this is scar in situ. I notice there's no free communication here. This is a uh, even a more scarred in case than the last case. Mm -hmm. uh, look, this is all sc scar tissue and fibrous tissue in through here. And so there's now no communication, but this is not tendon, it's not functional. Uh, and uh, we can see the tendons back here. Now in a situation like this, however, this is very chronic. So it may be very, be very difficult to repair that. You probably won't be able to get the tendon all the way over here. So, uh, you know, you, you would probably want to consider symptoms and maybe even consider a conservative treatment of someone like this. John? You know, you need a different kind of procedure here. Uh, transplanting of uh, uh, other tendons around the shoulder, like, yes. like latissimus dorsi, et cetera. So this, this becomes very complex. This yeah, is well, not something that you do it arthroscopically. Just uh, with it, well, yeah, we'll talk about the surgical treatment of massive chronic tears okay. later when we get to the to the surgical section. And then I'll shut up. Exactly. No, don't shut up. Keep talking. But but we we will talk about some of the the newer procedures that they're doing for the chronic All right. massive tears. Right, well, now this this one uh, is. Well, go ahead, John. Okay. Sorry. All right, so we have a 59-year-old with persistent pain after surgery. Uh, looks like there's been a rotator cuff repair. Uh, Myotendinous junction looks like it's retracted again. Yeah, so I'd be concerned for, again, a tear with some scar inside too. Let me see fluid in the, in the bursa here. Mm -hmm. There's the musculotendinous junction. Uh, uh, other image is we can see that the and there's an interstitial tear going posteriorly into the infraspinatus tendon, so it's a pretty big tear. Probably has some metal artifact here from the prior surgery, and uh, there we can see the infraspinatus partial tear and uh, inferior retraction. And then there's some. This is probably scar in situ coming across here. So we have two coronal images. Um, looks like there's a sizable subacromial subdeltoid fluid collection. Um, I don't really see the supraspinatus. Maybe it's, um, oh, it's, looks like it's completely torn. And then... <laughs> Could be. <laughs> completely torn and it's in the joint. There you go. And then uh, and the humeral head is yeah. elevated. Yeah, and there's a lot of edema in the humeral head as well. I haven't seen this very often, but this is something you should probably call the doctor about if you see it. And that's where it's torn, and then have the uh, tendon actually extend into the joint space itself. So, okay, it can happen. Taysen. All right, so... Looks like there's a 
free communication between the seven programs of Delta and Versa and the joint space. Uh, there's a full, probably a full thickness tear of the pseudospinatus, and there's extensive synovial thickening. Um, okay. Uh, what else do you have to say? Um, is the humeral head uh, located or? Yeah, it's uh, here really subluxed. Uh, Maybe you think it's a uh, more chronic there. Yeah, that, 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 that structure. Is that, is that, what, what's that, that structure? The problem is she can't move her arm. And. Which, uh, there's a good reason why she can't. Yeah. Here's the subscap. Oh, man. Yeah, it's uh, a materially. The biceps tour. Yeah. So these are tears of the rotator cuff and the distal tendons uh, subluxed into the joint space. Yeah, okay. She's seeing severe discomfort for the patient. So, yes, the head is uh, subluxed, so. Uh, that has not has to be reduced, et cetera. Right. I wonder how long she put up with this. Uh, that I don't know. It's a patient from New York. Okay. So here we see an X-ray, likely fluoro, arthrogram. They've injected contrast. Um, what kind of contrast? Uh, I, I maybe iodinated contrast. Okay. What kind? Iodinated, or maybe yep. it's gadolinium contrast. I'm not sure. It's iodinated contrast, and why? Well, it's what what you use in in uh, MRIs. Yeah, this well, is an X-ray. So uh, be it, it and it does it does look like it's in the joint. Uh, there's some what about this over here. That looks like a uh, cardiac pacer. Okay, so th this was back in the days before cardiac pacemakers were MR. Um, uh, what are they called? <laughs> Unsession. I've written papers on it. MR. Uh, that's gad gadolinium, uh, isn't it, John? No, this is iodinated contrast. The patient has a uh, pacemaker, and in this, this is an MR non compliant uh, pacemaker, so the person couldn't have MR, so they're injecting. No, I, I understand that, but uh, you can use gadolinium as a contrast. You can if it's with CT, but not with plain films. Plain films is oh, okay. Very sensitive. Uh, thank, thank you for okay. And then setting this straight. Yeah. What do you see up here? Uh, we see some contrast in in that sub subacromial right region. And then here's the CT. Mm, this yeah, again, fluid patient. there. Yeah, a tear, tear of the supraspinatus. So this is the yeah, tear on CT. Uh, most uh, cardiac pacemakers now are uh, can can go in point one five and one point five. I mean point one uh, one point five and three Tesla scanners, as long as you go through the appropriate protocol and have uh, proper monitoring. Uh, but in this day and age, uh, pacemakers are contraindicated for an MR scanner. But uh, just so you guys know, back in the really early days in 1988, 89, and 90, before we really knew that there was a danger with pacemakers, we inadvertently at Cedars scanned about 10 patients with the old fashioned pacemakers, and we had no problems with it. But uh, we didn't mean to, but we weren't careful about, about uh, screening at that particular time. Okay. So that's a tear on CT arthrography. Okay. So we have uh, two coronals. Um, looks like there's edema in that humeral head. I don't see a discrete tear, but it could be just like an avulsion. Yeah. So so it's a small non-displaced bony avulsion. Where's the but the 
Well, the cuff itself is intact. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, talking about the things that uh, Dr. Hawkins wanted to know uh, with uh, rotator cuff tears with uh, MR of the shoulder, the next one was fatty infiltration of the muscles. So, there are several ways to, to look at this. Uh, we're really kind of looking at supraspinatus and infraspinatus atrophy. Uh, decreased volumes on the sagittal scans, uh, which can be very misleading, as we'll discuss in a minute. There's the tangent sign, and then there's the amount of fat within the muscle itself. So this is a tangent sign where you actually image in the oblique sagittal plane uh, with respect to the scapula mm -hmm. right here. This is what it looks like. And you look to, at the supraspinatus tendon uh, between the superior part of the uh, uh, posterior uh, acromion here and the superior edge of the coracoid process. And the supraspinatus tendon should project above this uh, particular line. When you have supraspinatus atrophy, it's not supposed to project above the line. And when you see that, it's called the tangent sign. The, the trouble with this, and I recommend that you guys not use it, well, I'll show you in a minute. Well, basically, as you all know, the shape of the supraspinatus tendon is a cone shape, and it gets very small uh, laterally where, it, where the musculotendinous junction occurs. So as I show in a minute, you can have a big weightlifter with huge muscles with a supraspinatus that's gigantic who gets an acute, complete tear of the supraspinatus tendon. What happens? It retracts medially, and you can get a positive tangent sign, even though the patient has no, uh, no fatty atrophy, which occurred in this particular case. You can see this guy has massive uh, muscles. So what you're trying to use it for is, is if you have chronic long-standing tears, you get atrophy of the muscles. When you get fatty atrophy of the muscles, you often get scar tissue uh, within the fatty atrophy of the muscles. The muscles become very rigid. And if you go in and try to pull the tendon back over the head to insert it uh, in the uh, greater tuberosity, it's too stiff to do that. And if you try to do it, you can tear the tendon or you can tear the muscle, as we kind of talked about before. And if you put too much tension on it and you repair it, either your repair will fail or you'll tear more approximately within the tendon. And I'll show an example of that uh, later in these lectures. So but if you use this uh, sign, be very careful uh, because you can have false positives really when you don't want them, when they're acute athletes that have uh, very good muscles, and need surgery. So according to this, if you have a positive tendon sign, the patient's no longer a surgical candidate because you've got chronic atrophy and stiffness of the muscle. This was a young athlete. Uh, his muscle was perfectly normal. Uh, he just had proximal retraction. So be, be careful about uh, using it. Who's next? Is, are women uh, more... Have to have that done, or doesn't make any difference. I don't. I don't know. Okay, so the sixty-six nowadays, I think they're probably the same. Okay, sixty-six-year-old male with pain after acute trauma. So we have a sagittal view. Uh, it looks like there's a positive tangent sign. Um, yeah, the coronal images. So coronal images, it looks like there's a complete tear and with retraction of the supraspinatus and tendon. What about the muscle? Muscle looks pretty good there. Yeah, a positive tangent sign, but there's really no atrophy here. That's a perfectly normal muscle. Taste it. All right, 77-year-old female, acute injury and shoulder pain. Looks like the tangent sign is positive on here, too. So it looks like we have um, full thickness, uh, supraspinatus tear with retraction. Yeah, so you can see this is the cone shape. 
and it's retracted medially. So if you do a sagittal limit through here, you'll get a positive tangent sign. But again, we don't see a lot of fatty atrophy of the muscle here. Yes. So be careful. So the other thing to look for is fatty atrophy within the muscle. And uh, stage zero is no fat. Stage one is a few fatty streaks. Stage two is more muscle than fat, but a lot of fat. Stage three is equal muscles of fat and equal amounts of fat and muscle. Stage four is more fat than muscle. And according to this paper, uh, if you have stage three or four, the patient uh, is generally not a surgical candidate, but if they're zero to two, they are a surgical candidate. We'll see in a minute where more recent papers have looked at this and found out that actually the amount of fat within the muscle does not correlate very well at all with whether the patient should be surgical candidates or not. So I, I'm less anal about reporting this now than I did before a couple of recent papers came out showing that it's not an indication and it's a little bit dangerous because some people who have a lot of uh, fat within the muscle may be able to have very good repairs. Uh, they probably aren't going to have good tissues, so how well those repairs will last I don't know, and I haven't seen any studies actually comparing the long-term efficacy of rotator cuff repair uh, based upon the amount of fat within the muscles. Okay. Elior. I think scarring and retraction is uh, far more important than some fat in the, in the muscle. Okay. So here we have a full thickness tear, supraspinatus with retraction of the myotennis junction. Looking at the muscle itself, there's some fatty streaking within the muscle fibers, maybe stage one? Or... Well, I think about this is stage two. Okay. Yeah. Between one and two. Mm. Uh, my guess is if you see fatty uh, atrophy, of an isolated supraspinatus, and all the other muscles show no atrophy, it's probably important because that probably means that it's a chronic long-standing tear. So the, the, the chronicity of the tear is probably what correlates best with, uh, with whether it's scarred or not. Whereas if all the muscles show atrophy, then fatty atrophy is probably not going to be very important. Mm. But I don't know any data to, to support that. And here we can see this patient also has a positive tangent sign. I, I know one thing, I wouldn't promise this patient much. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Robert. All right. Uh, so we have, again, a retracted tear of the supraspinatus. Looks like there's a surgical anchor in that humeral head. So prior repair. Looking at the supraspinatus muscle itself, looks like there may be some more fat than muscles, maybe I actually look about equal, maybe two slash three. Equal amounts. And we can see the construct failed and it's retracted back. Mm -hmm. So this would be stage three, and maybe that go along with stage three is not good for the sure. pair of these. Right. Okay. Uh, you look at that, uh, and that last one, John, look at where the um, Screws are and uh, or, or so they're, they're in the trough uh, right next to the head, not lateral to the greater tuberosity. Uh, that, that's a kind of an unusual okay. construct, All right? Uh, that, that, I really don't know how you get the muscle, I mean, a tendon secured with, with those uh, anchors. I, I really don't. Okay. Well, it wasn't secured. Uh, obviously. <laughs> so we have a coronal view. Um, looks like there's probably been a complete tear of the supraspinatus tendon. So like there's complete fatty, almost complete fatty atrophy of the muscle. So stage four. Yeah. And then we can see, right, this is stage four. 
And we can see that there's superior migration of the humeral head that we'll talk about, uh, which also indicates chronicity. And that's a well, bad uh, prognosis. What's the most important thing that you see there? Uh, uh, and I remember I'm an orthopedic surgeon, not, not, not a radiologist. The most important thing? Um, hmm. Well, for me, it's, it, it's, it's a head is uh, uh, touching the acromial process. Uh, and uh, and uh, chrome uh, and uh, if you look at this, uh, now this uh, glenoid is really quite large compared to the head, uh, and arthritic changes are so. Uh, th this is a, a case where you you cannot fix surgically, to, in, in my opinion. Uh, I know we'll talk about surgery la later, but uh, good. Good job. This is an inoperable case, as far as I'm concerned. This yeah. is a re reverse uh, right. total replacement uh, candidate. So I won't, we'll talk about the uh, reverse yeah. non reverse yeah. uh, surgeries. There is a little bit of atrophy of the deltoid muscle here. The deltoid is critically important if you're thinking of of uh, putting in prostheses, but we'll talk about that later. Tayson, what do you think's going on here? All right, so looks like there's a atrophy of the areas in my Well, that's what you can see, severe fatty atrophy of the deltoid. Severe fatty atrophy of the teres minor, severe fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus, which we can see uh, right in through here, and other muscles here. Uh, the uh, latissimus dorsi is also very atrophic. Staying so, uh, what, what, what would you uh, uh, study next? Good, good question, John. So, uh, Tayson, what's your next? Uh, Recommended exam. Recommended exam after I see this atrophy? Yes. Um, I don't know, a physical exam? Uh, I, we won't torture you. Uh, it, it's a cervical spine. Um, so, so this patient had... Like denervation? Yeah, this patient had denervation atrophy, chronic due to central stenosis in the cervical spine. So we've seen a few of those and recommended the cervical spine uh, to for further evaluation. Not that you can really do a lot for this, but you, you might be able to want to do something to keep the neurologic disease from progressing any further, but you're not going to get those muscles back. Okay, then the other thing that Dr. Hawkins wanted is to know about elevation of the humeral head, which we've been talking about. And here we can see a case, uh, chronic uh, full thickness tear, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, proximal retraction back to here. This chronic with elevation of the humeral head and direct bone-on-bone -bone articulation with degenerative disease here. And you can see there's remodeling of the inferior surface of the acromion. So this has been this way for years. And uh, with all this chronic disease, you're really not going to be able to do uh, any surgeries except for possibly a a replacement. Okay, let's go on and talk about surgeries. So, rotator cuff repair, typically uh, in this day and age is done arthroscopically by suture anchors, where you put the suture anchor to the bone, you take the sutures from the anchor, tie it to the tendon, and bring it back again. Uh, now, it's important to realize that you're doing this not because you think that this repair is a permanent repair, because what will invariably happen if the repair is only a suture anchor repair is a suture anchor will pull out and the construct will fail. So what's important is you have to do this in such a way so that the tendon will adhere to the bone. And the way that occurs is that the tendon doesn't have the ability to attach itself but the bone has a remarkable t a tendency to grow. And if you irritate the bone, roughen it up so that you get bleeding 
uh, at the foot plate, you bring the tendon down and attach it so that it's stable uh, and isn't moving around. The, the bone will grow into the, into the tendon and you'll get a, a repair, a, bi a biologic repair. So that's what happens. If you don't get that repair, uh, the surgery will fail because the suture anchors will invariably pull out of the tendon over time. So that's what you're trying to do. The concept, this is a single anchor where you'll bring it down into the bone at this point, uh, suture it down, hopefully it'll stay down long enough to get uh, uh, biologic repair, and then, uh, uh, and then you're good. The concept of a double ankle repair is that your, the, your likelihood of having the best repair is if you have uh, the largest surface area possible between the tendon and the bone so that you get a large surface area that heals. The larger the surface area, the stronger it's going to be. So with double ankle row, you put one anchor proximal to the foot plate. You roughen up the foot plate so you get bleeding. You put another row distal to the foot plate. You bring the tendon down to where you want it, the bone to heal into it. And then you, you create a uh, uh, suturing technique to try to have uniform pressure of the tendon against the bone uh, throughout the area where you want it to heal. Problem is that some of the older techniques, you would buckle the tendon there and the center part wouldn't be down to the bone and wouldn't heal. Uh, so now they have techniques where they have kind of uniform pressure to try to get maximum cross-sectional cross area for healing between the tendon and the bone. So, so that's the concept behind uh, rotator cuff repair. Those are larger... Are there, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Um, you don't mean a, a, a single anchor. You mean a single row. Yeah, yeah. In other words, you can have two or three anchors, but then they're all in the same row. Yeah. Uh, then there's a double row. That's what you're getting to. Uh, now, but it's not a matter of number of anchors. It's a matter of uh, single row, double row, right? And uh, and there's another one uh, that, that that you go through through through, through the osseous uh, procedure, which sure. which I kind of like. Okay, now uh, all three three of them uh, that. that uh, Campbell's uh, loves the double row now. Yeah, uh, single row is uh, not used that much, but uh, uh, in the old days, uh, I'm sure you you would have brought this up. Uh, the price of the double row was uh, uh, quite high, but later they they noted that uh, uh, the single row was not as good a repair, and it, it failed far more often than the double double row. So the double row became more accepted. And I think that the Medicare is paying for it now. Right. Uh, yeah, it's it's the this. standard now. But actually, in the early days of this, the early papers showed that the single row and the double row were not different in their success rates. Uh, and that was one of those papers I was involved as a co-author on. Uh, and then it was realized that a big reason for that was the fact that the way in which the uh, the suturing was done would not put uniform pressure on the tendon, so you weren't increasing the cross-sectional area of the repair site. Once that changed, uh, papers sh started showing that the double row was better like it should have been. And uh, yeah, no, no, you have to cross the, the tendon in an X fashion so that that the whole tendon flattens out uh, in, in the foot plate. Yeah. Uh, single row, you cannot do that. With a single row, all you do is pull it into one place. With a double row, you, you, you have the entire tendon um, compressed. Well, when, so, when, we, when I show my study again later, which I will do here, uh, I'll, I can show you that, what it looks like from the bursal side. Uh, now, what, what I uh, what I like to do is I like to make a little trough, uh, just distal to where this anchor that you see there, um, right right in this area, uh, and, and then 
make a, a, a trough in there and pull the tendon into that trough so you have a lot of bone contact. Good. Good. And, and, and uh, the way they do the transosseous is very interesting is they don't use any screws. Uh, they do a punch type of uh, uh, entry for the for the sutures. Okay. Uh, and and then usually they use three punches, and then uh, uh, then they, they use an instrument to pass the sutures um, through the tendon and pull them in. Good. It's a very interesting way to do it, and I I kind of like that technique uh, arthroscopically. Uh, open technique, uh, you, you do it different things. Uh, right. uh, open technique, you usually do a transosseous type of procedure. Okay. And then here we can see a rotator cuff tear. We're just partial volume out on this image. And after surgery, you can see it's all closed up and no longer have any fluid going through the area of the defect. It's it's very important. The main thing is to get as much contact to the bone, raw bone. And those guys that don't uh, abrade the bone to bleeding bone are, are they're going to fail. Yeah, right. Because the bone so doesn't really bleeding, bleeding bone. Yeah, and it just shows if you have a small tear, sometimes you can do just a single anchor. Uh, usually, in the supraspinatus, as you guys will see. You'll have, uh, uh, as, as John was saying, uh, rows. Most of the time now we'll see double rows techniques. Uh, there was a technique where you could do two proximal and only one distal, but now most people do two proximal and two distal, uh, like in my shoulder, and we'll look at it again in a minute, or not a minute, probably next week. Uh, in the subscap, if it's uh, often associated with tears like this, you'll have... Uh, tendinopathy of the biceps, like I showed in my shoulder, as well as a tear of the superior insertional fibers of the uh, subscap. And those typically are treated by a single suture anchor, and you don't really have space to do a double row for that, generally. And the biceps is almost always involved to some extent, uh, and, and usually they're, they're doing a uh, repair of the supraspinatus or, or, or well, basically the rotator cuff, uh, then uh, you do a tenodesis of the of the biceps approximately uh, right the, in the joint area, or, uh, right distal to the head of the humerus, rather than uh, further down. Yeah, yeah, and I, I really think there's a lot of data now to show that the tear the superior component of the subscap and uh, tendinopathy of the biceps tendon tend to be much more symptomatic lesions than isolated supraspinatus tendon tears, which may be one of the reasons we will often see chronic supraspinatus tendon tears uh, uh, in people who may not have had a lot of symptoms. Biceps is very sensitive. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about some clinical examples of the biceps in pain later when we get to the bicep section. Okay, Eliora. Okay, we've got coronal PD fat set images. On the left, we see a full thickness tear, the supraspinatus. On the right, we've had surgery. We have some suture anchors yeah, at the so foot plate. Like double row technique. Double row, uh-huh. Yeah. We got- Most of the time now, this, this lateral row is typically placed a little bit more peripheral than this, but this is really the the uh, foot plate that you need to roughen up and have the tendon come down to. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the medial anchor is right in the head. Yeah. And, and the other anchor is uh, medial to the lateral aspect of the greater tuberosity, you'd like to have those a little further lateral, both of them. Okay. If, if you can, uh, you know, you can't always do it. Sometimes you have to 
um, put a tendon in right, you remove some of the articular surface and, uh, and, and get a little trough there and yeah. put the anchors in. Uh, there are many different ways you can do this, but you, you, you like to fix it so because the patient will have pain if you don't do it that way. Yeah, and, you uh, and I have no problem abducting the arm 45 degrees or so for a couple of weeks in a sling. Uh, I don't worry about uh, uh, the, the, the motion loss. Uh, and people will get their motion back. Okay, yeah, good. So, okay. There's another example. And so we have an arthrogram. Uh, looks like there's another double row technique here. Um, uh, construct, I think, is intact. But... So that's what they wanted to know. It just shows that it's very common in patients after they have surgery, mm -hmm. even if the construct's intact, to have communication between the joint space and the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So that doesn't mean you have a tear. You have to look specifically at the construct itself. And this was an intact construct, but with a positive fluid leaking into the uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Okay. So we have two coronal views here. It looks like there's prior rotator cuff repair with um, uh, suture anchors in the humeral head there. Um, it looks like there's a lot of scar tissue. Yeah, that looks like all mostly scar tissue. And then they, yeah, the myotinous junction is retracted. Right. All right. So, th so this is actually uh, healing of the construct, but this is really mostly scar tissue here. As you can see, the distal end of the tendon is probably in this location. And probably there is a distal end of the tendon, and this is all scarring in through here. Uh, which, you know, it, the symptoms are really the key things here because as long as the deltoid is intact, the, the, the supraspinatus tendon is uh, uh, not really that important for function. But The problem with this, John, and the way I see it is the anchors are too far distal. Right, and there's no lateral. proximal row here. Yeah, so... Uh, I don't see how you can really uh, put sutures in this tendon and fix it. I, I have a real problem with this. Yeah, it didn't work that well. And here's another case also. In this case, you have a full thickness tear. This is actually a tear uh, with a free flow of fluid through the, through the construct. If, if you see fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, but the construct's intact, then it's not a tear of the construct. But if you see fluid there going through uh, a defect in the construct, then that's a tear of the construct. Basically, you only really have one good chance at fixing these. Uh, the second go around is uh, far, far more difficult. Yeah. And the results are uh, not that great. Tayson, last case. Um, Looks like a chronic tear of the uh, supraspinatus tendon with retraction and uh, superior migration of the hero head with remodeling of the probe. Like grade four yeah. atrophy of the muscle here retracted back. Bone on bone articulation here with a lot of chronic remodeling. See how the inferior surface is remodeled. That means it's been this way for a long time. So this is 111707. Here we can see marked fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus uh, uh, muscle, probably fatty atrophy of the infraspinatus as well. Uh, tear. Okay, what's happened here? Uh, looks like there was Attempted a double row uh, repair. Okay, so we can see both rows, double row repair, and but I still see the tendon is both oh, anchors well, are in there. I'm head. not sure I understand. Is there something else I can help with? We don't need you, Siri. 
I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? Yeah, I mean, I think the defendant is at the Glenwood Rim. Um, so what's in the wrong place? Did they remove the acromion? Uh, well, I think they did an acromioplasty when they did the surgery. They removed too much of the acromion, so the patient has a lot of superior instability. But what's this? Yeah, that's uh, the superspinated kind of movement. Yeah, so here this is a, uh, so they repaired it, but there is a complete tear of the construct. Yeah. And then here you can see on the T2 weighted image without fat suppression, how clearly you can see the distal end of the tendon, and this was a failed repair. Uh, but this well, you, patient, can't, you can't put uh, anchors from top to bottom uh, in the head. That, that's just not going to happen. I mean, it won't work. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's it. much better not to do anything uh, than to yeah. do this. Well, this is the proximal row, and this is one of the anchors of the distal row. There, there's another. Yeah, but that's right in the head, John. What? Uh, the, the proximal screw is in the head, and so is the distal screw. Well, all the suture anchors it, are... It's not a lateral to the... It's not in the greater tuberosity area. It's distal. Uh, it's from, uh, proximal to it. Medial. I mean, medially to it. Here. Uh, so it's bound to, to fail. Okay. Uh, and where's the chromium? Oh. Right there, as I say, it got one inch to abduct. No, not one inch, but about a centimeter and a half, maybe. Yeah, so that's that's so a that, that, that's uh, that's that's failed right from the get go. Okay, and then here we can see another suture anchor with a uh, uh, fail, yeah, another, another ugly one. Yeah, but here's a situation where the construct itself was probably intact, and this was a tear that probably a second tear that occurred in the tendon adjacent to the repair site. And we can see the anterior fibers torn and retracted here. Like I've always said, if you, if you don't do a whole bunch of cases uh, arthroscopically, you have no business doing them. Okay. You gotta get extra training to do this procedure. Right. Uh, otherwise, you do it open. There's nothing wrong with doing an open procedure. Um, just the complications are a little higher, but not, not that big a deal. But an open procedure um, is okay if, you, if you're not totally trained in uh, arthroscopic procedures or something fails with an uh, arthroscope while you're in surgery. Um, you got to be able to do it open. So uh, I've done a, a lot of open ones, and 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 there's nothing wrong with doing them. And, and you can do them a lot faster than you do with the arthroscope. Uh, I haven't seen an open procedure in a long time, John. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you haven't. But that uh, I'm looking at some of the results you're you're showing here, and. Uh, 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 yes, not, realize not I'm, too good. I'm showing you're looking, you're looking at the people's people that are, uh, know what they're doing. I, I'm uh, I'm just showing examples of failures so that people see what yeah, right. looks like because they can always recognize successes generally. Yeah, okay, I understand. Well, why don't we uh, stop here? You're, you're, de you're, you're dealing with people that send you cases are people that uh, have been trained in arthroscopy. Okay. Um, well, we get them from everywhere. Yeah, but but you're right. I, I've dealt mostly with people who are well trained, but but at Radnet we get cases from a lot of not well trained orthopedic surgeons. Yeah, that, that that's the cases you're showing, or these are old cases anyway. Yeah, that's right. Okay, why don't we why don't we cut here and uh, uh, I will. Uh, let me just stop the there. Yeah, so, and uh, you guys have a good weekend, and uh, we'll start the the war again next Monday. You too, and uh, see you on Monday. Okay, thanks, John. Right, thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah, have see, a good weekend, everybody.